joining us today uh, for our discussion around data subject requests, what seems like a simple request, but then leads to a really complex process. Uh, my name is Leila Goltry, and I am the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Reliance AI. I've been working in tech, AI, and data protection for more than 15 years, so I'm really aging myself here, um, but building global data privacy programs for businesses in very diverse sectors and, and tech and healthcare, AI, and other industries like the HR um, and cloud computing space with Workday, FinTech at Adaptive Insights. I was actually the first privacy lawyer at GM Cruise on the autonomous vehicle. Um, and with clients across the world, um, really across Europe, Asia, uh, the MENA region, and of course the Americas. Um, and it was through my experience working with various clients in house and in big law at Allen and Overy um, and in private practice where I just had a lack of really great pr privacy technology. Um, I just couldn't believe that with all the new AI and new solutions that were being adopted by my engineering counterparts, that we didn't have something more effective for lawyers, for privacy and data governance professionals and for the security team. I really wanted to start Reliance AI to identify solutions and kind of find ways of leveraging some of the AI developments that we had to solve some of the most fundamental issues that we face as a society today. Now, as it turns out, um, we are having this conversation on a day when 160 countries are now covered by new data privacy and data protection laws. That's 82% of the world's total population. And one fundamental principle of being covered by these laws is the protection of the individual data subject. So who is that? Uh, the data subject is a person like you or me, um, and we have rights. We have rights to make certain requests, including what are called data subject requests or DSRs, as I'll refer to them throughout our conversation today. Um, and this really represents a fundamental aspect of data privacy regulation. We have offered through these different data protection laws that we talked about individuals the right to access, delete, and correct their personal data held by organizations. So sounds simple, right? Uh, but what happens on the back end when an organization actually receives this request can be really complex. Um, and so we only have 25 minutes today, but we're going to try to go over operationalizing and navigating some of the complexities that organizations kind of have to address as they receive some of these data subject requests um, and generally some of the latest developments as well as how technology can help to operationalize uh, the response to a data subject, especially when you are dealing with a variety of different systems that have very complex backend processes. So like I said, from the consumer perspective, submitting a DSAR seems really straightforward, but just filling out the form, requesting an, an, an access to data or a deletion of personal information as a consumer, and then receiving that response in return, either with a copy of your data or confirmation that your data has been deleted. But beneath that request actually lies a labyrinth of complexities. So let's go ahead and discuss uh, some of those complexities that organizations need to navigate. So let's talk generally about once a DSAR is submitted. So I'm the data subject, I'm coming into an organization and I'm requesting that I receive um, information about how my data is being processed. Um, now what happens is this information is generally received by a privacy or legal team, and we now need to kick off a series of both technological and legal procedures within that organization. So what seems like a simple act of just identifying and producing or reviewing relevant information really demands a sophisticated infrastructure that's capable of traversing diverse data systems and also making sure that we're meeting a whole plethora of privacy regulations and requirements. And this process extends far beyond the purview of just the privacy team. You have a burden placed on any team that might be impacted by that particular data subject request. So that might go to your HR team. Often we receive requests from candidates. It's one of the most common types of data subject requests that an organization might receive. Um, it might go to your marketing team, one of the other 
commonly received requests. And for purposes of the discussion today, we're really going to focus on the rights that data subjects like you and me have with respect to access and deletion. But there are other rights that are afforded. Do not sell and do not share here in California are some of them. Uh, but the burden that this place is not only on the privacy team, but other teams without kind of correct technology tooling can just be a big time commitment for these organizations, uh, for different organizations. And one of the ways in which we need to start, let's say you don't have technology supporting you, is at the outset authentication of a data subject's identity. Uh, this is critical, and there are a host of rules surrounding this. For example, you have to ensure that you are not collecting more information than is generally required to verify the identity of that data subject. And then there are a host of complexities that really need to be taken care and attention of uh, with respect to children's processing of data. So let's say a child requests that their data um, be deleted. Do we need to go through the authentication through parental approval that their data can be deleted? Um, and we need to be particularly uh, sensitive to potential developments with fraud and identity theft, which is very commonplace. How do we know that the data subject who is submitting their data is actually who they say they are? And that we're not kind of dealing with some kind of fraudulent bad actor who's trying to engage in some kind of identity theft. So other considerations um, as we go through that authentication process. And this process becomes even more complex when we add in the potential volume of data subject requests that might occur at a single point in time. So let's say, for example, an organization experiences a highly publicized data privacy or data security incident. This can generate a significant uptick in data subject requests or DSRs. And the teams that are tasked with fulfilling these requests must address the identity verification of a large number of data subjects all at once. And there are time constraints that are associated with this. So there are jurisdictions that give you as much as 45 days uh, to respond to a quest, uh, request, and then some jurisdictions that give you as little as only 15 days to respond to a, a request. Um, and navigating the different complexities and how you're going to uh, address the time commitments that are involved is also really important. So making sure to meet those regulatory deadlines, having that constant identification of have we met these responses? And it's upon the receipt of the request. That's something else really to keep in mind. Often uh, companies think that actually this is after we verified that the data subject is who they say they are. So this is not from the point under most laws um, from which the authentication takes place, rather from the point at which the data subject has submitted the request. So let's say authentication takes one or two or three weeks time. Um, you still have to be using the, the clock from the very date at which you received that request. Something really important to keep in mind as we're navigating this and something, um, whether or not you have technology tooling that you really gotta stay ahead of. Um, so let's continue to sort of unravel um, some of the layers of complexity here, um, which is upon the receipt of that data subject request, and let's say we've gone through that authentication process. Um, and actually one note I should point out is that uh, provided you don't have enough time, you can certainly request extensions of these types of data subject requests. That's perfectly acceptable if there's a reasonable reason why you could not fulfill uh, that particular data subject request in that period of time that was allotted. So let's say you need another 30 days. Uh, you can request that as so long as it's reasonable um, and done in good faith. Um, so, but other complications to this are questions involving the extraction of data from different systems. Um, because as we know, it's not just one particular entity which might be holding a data subject's data, but there is a whole host of subprocessors or just general processors who might equally have access to that data subject's data. So when these requests are fulfilled, you this sets off really a domino effect and a whole chain of lineage to understand where a data subject's data lives. And we need to be working through that whole data lineage in order to understand generally where the data subject's data lives. So while we're talking about data subjects today, um, and the data subject requests that they may make, we really need to start out with that foundational data inventory and data map to understand generally what data you have, 
who is accessing that data and what's being done to it. So that when a data subject makes that particular request that you are ready and able to fulfill that request within those jurisdictional time requirements that we talked through. Then we have questions around redaction and retention of specific data subjects information. That is also really key and important. Um, and we've always got to balance transparency um, with the data protection requirements and protecting a company's information. So there are a whole host of areas that we can discuss around that that are also very important to take into consideration as well. And it's important that as you go through this exercise that you are working with a legal team outside counsel. And um, if you connect with me after and you're looking for referrals, I'm happy to make some um, who can help you navigate through these different and difficult complex requirements around how should we be responding? How should we be engaging? Um, and often, you know, we talked about bad actors from the authentication standpoint, but you might even have bad actors that are the data subjects themselves, unfortunately. Um, sometimes issuing a data subject request can be used against an organization um, if, a, you know, for example, an employee has not parted on good terms or um, you know, this is coming out from a competitor where they just want to keep issuing these requests and make it more and more difficult for you to um, fulfill them and just hitting you um, with a series of different requests through online um, agencies that actually just for uh, their entire software platform is to issue data subject requests. So there are a lot of different ways in which this may come to being. Um, and then I wanted to highlight that laws are continuing to evolve here in the U.S. at the state level. Um, I think as of this uh, talk today, we have 16 uh, privacy laws um, that have been adopted. That was my latest count. Um, but we also see privacy laws being developed at the global level. And we have got to adopt our processes and adapt them to remain compliant um, as these laws are changing across different states. So a very important question that organizations need to address up front is, are we going to apply just one set of rules commonly across all data subjects, no matter where they're based and no matter what a law applies? So I highly recommend that you take the opportunity to work with legal counsel around generally, how can we, um, how can we ensure that we understand which laws apply to us, number one. And number two, from an operationalizing perspective and responding to these types of requests, will we just apply the most stringent law to that data subject request fulfillment? Or are we going to say, we'll have a different process for data subjects in California versus Washington state versus any data subjects that might be based in France. So understanding generally how you're going to respond to those requests, will you do this, um, you know, kind of uniformly across the way? And I can tell you, having operationalized this repeatedly um, over 15 years, it is so much easier um, to have a single process for all data subjects. Uh, but sometimes the business doesn't want that because some jurisdictions are stricter than others. Uh, they want to be able to do more with data subjects data. So they may say, actually, we don't wish to have this apply across the board. Instead, uh, we wish to have different requirements for different data subjects, depending on where they're based. So um, your role as a data protection officer, as a security professional, and as a privacy professional will certainly be to ensure that you are um, keeping that information secure um, and private, but also uh, operationalizing this in the most effective way. And even established regulations like the GDPR and the CCPA continue to evolve uh, with some of these new amendments and modifications. And I can, I'm going to give a few examples of some of the latest and greatest coming out of the uh, European uh, Court of Justice, where we've had some recent decisions that are really impacting the way in which we fulfill data subject requests. So we'll get to, to that uh, just momentarily. But really getting that understanding of these legal frameworks Understanding and being able to stay abreast of the different changes is truly essential for ensuring that DSAR responses meet some of these regulatory standards and mitigate that risk of non-compliance. Um, so one of the easiest ways uh, to get your name um, in front of a regulator is that a data subject is complaining that your organization did not treat uh, their data with the level of care and attention that it deserved or in missed a data subject request fulfillment deadline. 
So it's incredibly important that we um, ensure that we are mitigating that risk of non-compliance across the board and trying to truly find ways to stay on top of these different changes and to automate as much of this as we can to know and have confidence and faith that the system we have in place from the moment that a data subject request is submitted, received, the data subject is then authenticated, and now we're going through our systems and pulling that data, um, that all of that is going to be just like clockwork um, and really have a streamlined process. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, and so I mentioned I wanted to speak to some European cases, and one of them is really fresh off the press um, just a couple of months ago um, about providing the specific identity of data recipients um, unless they explicitly um, state that uh, they only want the categories of recipients. So one of the data subject request rights that uh, data subjects hold is largely to uh, understand who is accessing their data and what's being done to it. Now, today, and until this case just a few months ago, um, we were supplying organizations across Silicon Valley and really globally were supplying categories of data recipients. So in other words, they would say, we are generally sending out your data to a database provider or we're sending out your data um, to a cybersecurity company who is ensuring that your data remains encrypted at rest and in transit. So you could give high level responses to data subjects previously um, around who is accessing their data. But after this case has just gone in, uh, has just been adopted and this decision was just adopted by um, the uh, court of justice. Now, it's only if a data subject says that we only want the categories of recipients. Otherwise, you have to provide the specific identity of the data recipients. So instead of just saying we have a database provider, you will have to say that that's GCP or that's AWS um, and be very, very specific about generally um, who is processing data. So this is a tremendous lift for a lot of organizations. If you don't have a robust data inventory and map in place, that's been constantly monitoring and managing that for you to provide those quick summaries that are really maintained and up to date. Also, um, one thing to point out is that while this is true about the categories of recipients, the employees of a data processor or controller do not need to be revealed. So we don't have to say that Jane Doe um, is the actual recipient of data. We can generally say that this is the organization because those employees have rights to privacy as well. There have also been developments with respect to charging fees for data subject requests. Um, and the court has held um, in the European Union that this is now incompatible with the GDPR. Uh, we need to provide uh, copies of data free of charge. And we cannot say that, yes, we'll provide a copy of your data, but only if you pay for it. That's not going to really pass muster in Europe anymore. Um, however, organizations do have the right to protect themselves against kind of claims of um, data subject requests, claims of harassment, which we alluded to earlier, um, by putting in place reasonable fees under certain conditions. Um, and then broadly, um, so these are some of just the latest developments over the last couple of months that we've seen. So we see that this is a constantly evolving space, yet another reason why having good technology and good legal counsel is so critical. Um, and then some of the more kind of sticky, complex data subject requests that you might be receiving are often in the employment context. Now, often what happens is if a data subject submits a data subject request saying, send me all the data you have on me, in the HR context, this raises a whole host of complexities because not only does the data subject have rights to their privacy, but in addition, those interviewers at organizations also have rights to their privacy as well. The interviewers have the ability to say, listen, I have rights to privacy. I don't want this person who I interviewed as a candidate and then ultimately said no to, um, to know what I thought or what I was thinking generally um, about their ability to do the job. That's my right to privacy. Navigating some of these issues is also really important um, in making sure that the organization when fulfilling a data subject request 
uh, is redacting the information like the interviewers um, personal thoughts on a candidate's ability to do the job before responding to any data subject requests because solving one data subject request uh, might actually cause issues with another. So navigating that very carefully and strategically with the counsel of an attorney that's guiding you, I think is just absolutely critical. Now, um, I don't think that it would be a conversation around privacy and security uh, without talking about AI. So I do think we should spend a minute talking about just generally the role of artificial intelligence. Um, and as AI has really rapidly grown in its capabilities, uh, there are ways in which we can leverage technology. Um, and of course, I'm a co-founder at Reliance AI, so I'm quite biased, but um, I do believe that we have the best data subject request fulfillment solution on the market. Um, that's because we have set that atop of that foundational data mapping and inventory. And AI can help us to do our jobs efficiently. Uh, we can understand where data is living on a continuous basis. So it's not just based on manual forms or manual surveys, but the AI is learning and saying, Yes, you had your data subjects data living here, but this has now changed. Reliance is able to keep up with these types of developments. And whether or not you're using Reliance AI, uh, what I think is so critical is ensuring that you have that constant observability into the changes that are happening with data. Uh, we've tried to solve data subject requests the manual way, and I can tell you from experience, it is a really broken way of doing things. Um, if data is changing or moving or shifting or a new uh, data recipient is there uh, and we don't have technology embedded as a co-pilot in our technology stack, how are we to know? Uh, we need that level as practitioners and operators of observability into what's going on within the technology stack in order to really address and fulfill data subject requests in a comprehensive way. Um, and this must be continuously monitored and updated to evolve with this regulatory landscape and the requirements. Um, and so I know we are coming up on time here, so there's quite a lot more to address, um, but understanding the complexities inherent in DSAR responses really requires this holistic approach that encompasses obviously the technology um, solutions, but also uh, legal and reputational considerations. I always like to institute what I call the New York Times test. Imagine if you didn't do this the right way, what would it look like in that New York Times headline and how would that impact your reputation? Um, especially uh, with respect to the various developments in AI ensuring AI governance and a complete understanding all the way through AI models in different systems is absolutely critical. So organizations really must invest in robust systems that are really capable of efficiently and accurately identifying, extracting, and reviewing that data to streamline the response process as much as possible. And from a reputational standpoint, transparent and efficient DSAR processes are essential for maintaining consumer trust, maintaining the trust of your organization, and safeguarding your organization's reputation to the public. So establishing those clear processes, understanding when you're subject to different laws, understanding how you're going to get access to this data without hopefully disrupting a lot of different teams in the process, um, but ensuring that your staff is also trained on how to respond and that we don't sort of willy-nilly respond to data subject requests is really important because a lot of legal um, responsibilities and obligations kick in the moment that data subject request is received. And then centralizing the management of data subject requests should be a key focus area. Now, one thing that I didn't have the opportunity to talk to in so much detail is the redaction of these processes, how we can leverage AI to ensure that we are redacting information appropriately, and what Reliance AI offers is these smart redactions. Instead of having different systems where we are working in redactions and in individual files, leverage smart redactions to save you hours and hours of work um, across any different type of data subject request. Um, and then I guess I will go ahead and wrap up and we can see if there are any questions here. I know we're just coming up on time, um, but really leveraging technology for efficient DSAR management is so critical. I cannot overstate that enough. Um, automation is every organization's secret weapon to taming a DSAR process. 
And this is how we can implement automated workflows and give time back to all the different teams. Um, and so please do connect with me. I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have, offer any recommendations. Um, I'm Layla Goldtree. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can also visit our website at reliance.ai. So I'll pause to see if there are any questions here. Um, otherwise, I will pass it on to the next speaker. But thank you all so much for joining.